I happen to be a big fan of some stories from more than a hundred years ago by a British author named Arthur Conan Doyle. All told, this series had 56 sto short stories and four novels, written between 1892 and 1927. If you don't know what I'm talking about yet, this might help. Elementary, my dear Watson. Yes, Sherlock Holmes. If you still don't recognize the stories, that's okay, bear with me. Holmes is the main figure in the series. He's a private detective in London, and he is the master of logical thinking, careful reasoning based on evidence, solving crimes, and so on. I first read some of Sherlock Holmes' stories when I was a teenager, and he became my hero. At one point in the series, Holmes reveals that behind a crime wave in London, blackmail, murder, and so on, behind it all is a single connection, or better yet, a single person. His name, Professor Moriarty. Everyone else involved in, this, in the crime wave is just a two-bit figure. But like a spider weaving a web, Professor Moriarty is the root cause and the guiding mind. And so Holmes is out to find him, outwit him, and defeat his great enemy. The other people involved play their roles, but the real enemy is that one person. He's never visibly present at the scene of the crime, but he's behind it all. You ask, why do I bring this up today when we are reading and pondering Jesus' agony in the garden, his arrest and Peter's denial? Well, to answer that question, let me ask another one. How many people are key to these verses from Luke 24? One person comes to mind right away, of course, the Lord Jesus. And others are there, 12 apostles, counting Judas, and some of the chief priests, and the temple guard, and a servant girl, and a couple of others, and, a, and several crowds of people. And they all play their part, so to speak. But Luke's gospel reveals in a unique way that behind it all is one figure, one person, if I can use that term, Satan. There's Jesus, and there's the great enemy who isn't even named in the verses that we read tonight. But let me show you what I mean, and let me also say that all these verses I'm going to mention here, uh, found in Luke's gospel, and remarkably, only in Luke's gospel. Like Matthew and Mark, Luke tells us that early in his ministry, the Lord Jesus was directly tempted by Satan. When that event is over, however, only Luke makes this direct statement. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from Jesus until an opportune time. Satan would be back. Here's another one, and you might remember it from our Ash Wednesday reading. There, Luke begins to tell the events of the Passover meal, and that night when Jesus was going to be betrayed. First, he says that the chief priests and their allies were looking for a way to destroy Jesus. And then he writes, Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, and he went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers on how he might betray Jesus. John's Gospel has a similar statement, but Luke is making it clear that now, now the moment for which Satan has been waiting, that opportune time has come. Satan is behind the plan, the plot to arrest Jesus. And there is this from last week's reading from verse 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you all, that he might sift you all like wheat. Now, yes, next comes Jesus' promise of Peter's turning back again after it's all been said and done. But the fact remains, Satan is going to separate Sift and winnow, shake the apostles and see who is wheat and who is chaff, blown away by the wind. So yes, in this reading tonight, there is Judas, and there are the chief priests and their allies. There are the apostles, but Satan is directing, influencing, attacking all of them. He's behind it all. Jesus knows that Satan is behind it all, under it all. The chief priests and the, their group think that it's their clever secret that they made it all work. Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss and they bring force against him. It looks like it was their plan and that their plan worked. But Jesus knows better. He says, 
I used to be in the temple courtyards every day, and if you wanted to arrest me as if I were a robber, you could have done it then. But it's happening now, because this is your hour, and even more, this is the power of darkness. The power of darkness, Satan's power. When the disciples ignore Jesus' warning for them to pray, how do they fare when Satan attacks? They scatter like chaff. While Jesus is praying in agony that none of us can even come to close to imagining, the apostles fall asleep. And then one of the twelve betrays Jesus with a kiss, and Jesus must undo the violence of another one. And then Peter, who promised that he was ready to go to, Je go to prison with Jesus and to death, is following from a distance. And speaking through a servant girl and two others, Satan comes at Peter, and Satan sifts him. And Peter is undone. Jesus said it would happen. And on his way to, to stand before the Sanhedrin, Jesus looks straight at Peter. And Peter remembers. But Luke tells us that Peter only remembers the bad news. He didn't remember that Jesus promised that Peter would turn again. And so Peter is undone. He goes outside and he weeps bitterly. Not until the first Easter morning will Peter be restored as Jesus had promised he would be. In a way then, every other human figure in this reading gets thinner and thinner, less and less substantial, until they almost disappear. Yes, of course, the religious authorities still have Jesus under arrest, but the power behind their evil is the evil one. And so this reading shows Jesus and Satan, Jesus versus Satan, Satan out to destroy Jesus, and if it doesn't sound too dramatic to say, on one level, Satan will win. Satan will succeed. And here is the truly amazing thing about that. Jesus knows that too, and he willingly accepts it. While the apostles were sleeping, Jesus was praying and praying in an agony that no one else has ever known. He knew what was coming, and despite the mystery of this agony and struggle, his prayer and his choice were clear. Father, your will be done. Father, I will drink the cup. This cup is full to the brim. It's full of God's response to evil and sin. It's full of God's rightful and righteous judgment. And it's a cup that is prepared for people who are guilty and people who are evil. The Old Testament prophets spoke fairly often of this particular cup. It's for God's enemies to drink. But Jesus will drink it, though he's the only person ever to live who deserves not one drop from that cup. The path toward drinking that cup runs through arrest and trial, unjust and unfair accusations, spitting and beating and suffering and death, all while carrying on his shoulders the weight of evil and Satan's hatred and the cowardice and the failure of the disciples. That's enough to destroy anyone. That's enough to destroy everyone. And Satan and his allies are out to destroy Jesus. And in a way, they will succeed. The perfectly innocent Jesus will be numbered among the transgressors. And he will die, commending his spirit to the Father. The wages of sin is death, and Jesus will die. Friends, this much is crystal clear. Satan hates God, and he hates Jesus. So without a doubt, we say that that night, Satan meant all of this for evil. Evil against Judas, against the other apostles, against everyone. And Satan meant this for evil against Jesus. But here is the glory, and here is the wonder, and here is the promise and the praise. God meant it for good. He meant it all for good. Pause with me over just one small piece of this reading, something that goes by so quickly that we might overlook it. We might miss what it means. Verse 61, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Jesus is bound, he is arrested. He is on his way to death. But Luke still calls him the Lord. And in the cramped quarters of ancient Jerusalem, there is Peter in the courtyard of the high priest's house. 
And now they lead Jesus out of that house and he can turn and see the man who has just denied that he even knows who Jesus is. And at that moment, Luke tells us all that Peter can remember is the Lord's prediction that Peter would deny Jesus. That's what Peter remembers. What Simon doesn't remember yet is that Jesus had prayed for him. What Simon doesn't remember in that moment is that the time will come when Simon, the traitor, the turncoat, will turn again. As Jesus said, Jesus said it, and Simon's faith will return, and he will strengthen the others who, like him, have been sifted like wheat. Simon doesn't seem to remember the promise, but Jesus remembers because Jesus made the promise. Jesus knew that God meant all of this for good, for Simon's good, and for your good, and for mine. All the evil and all the authority of the evil one came against the innocent Son of God. Every sin, every accusation, every temptation came against Jesus like a storm. And like a storm, it had an end. And the evil spent itself, expended itself, and Jesus died. But then, because God is the God of life in reversal, the God who takes evil and uses it for good, God the Father raised his Son from the dead, never to die again. Even death itself has no power anymore, in the case of Jesus, the Lord, God's Son. And if death has no power, that means that sin has no power. And if death and sin have no power, that means Satan is defeated. And God wins in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our scripture moves us toward that seeming defeat and destruction and that perfect victory. We see Satan and Jesus and we know how the contest was finished. God wins on Easter and we win on Easter too.